Good afternoon. I think we are absolutely live on Facebook right now. And I'm so excited for, well, first of all, last week we had to skip a show because I was driving from Kansas City back down to Houston. And it would have been really hard to try to um, have a, uh, oh gosh, my goodness. You know, the, Facebook recently changed their uh, live or streaming live thing mm -hmm. when you go from Zoom to Facebook. It's a different graphic that pops up now than used to. And then it also shows us the current, you know, there's a 20 second delay. Um, and then it obviously popped up with the audio on for me just now, which was kind of crazy. But uh, if you would like to go to my Facebook page and see the current stream and share it to your networks, um, that would yeah. be great. While I introduce you, we have with us today, Michelle Marquardt DeVoe. Um, I'm just gonna call you Superwoman because in my <laughs> eyes, I, I, I literally like the, you came on my radar, like I said, um, w over the, the 2020 virtual Nats conference, you gave an incredible lecture about subscription-based pricing yeah. with with a like a private voice studio, um, but then as I sort and, and that was just like wow, this is incredible, uh, which we can definitely uh, and I definitely want to talk about. Um, but then just the more and more I've gotten to know you through our mutual friend Dana Varga, um, and then of course everything yeah. pops up and I see that we all have you know it's a, we, there's like 43 people in the business and we all know each other really well, so it's been really great. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> For being here it's just so incestuous really kind of i mean kind of sure kind yeah. of call it like how, it is. how how are you you having a good day so far so far so good i would good. like everyone listening to know that i am an amazing mother because i did not kill my child for not coming home and then not telling us where he was so kudos to me brava thank you but I was a little, that like got me a little bit, <gasps> you know, cause you, yeah. you know, you like, I mean, you like your kids. Most you of want them. them to be safe and healthy and alive. Yeah. And um, so that was a little scary, but other than that, it's been going good playing whack-a-mole with all my tasks. <laughs> oh, I thought you just meant you had like an old whack-a-mole um, like game from the carnivals or whatever. And you were just like bored. And so you were playing it, which would also kind of be cool. I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> now I'm going to go on to like Etsy or what is that place? Where Facebook Marketplace? Buy... I don't know. Yeah, I'm just be like, whack-a-mole game. Absolutely. Um, good. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, recently, um, uh, as in like day before yesterday, yeah. my, my grandmother, I'm very, very fortunate that I have longevity genes in my family. My my dad's mother passed away at a hundred and a half. She was she was about halfway uh, along being a hundred and one. Wow. And my my uh, dad's father passed away at eighty eight, and then my mother's father passed away at ninety four, and my mother's mother, my grandma, um, is currently a hundred. She'll be a hundred and one in November. Yeah. And uh, wow. the, other, the other day. Uh, she had a little fall, uh, which was kind of took us by surprise, of course. And um, the, the the shocking thing was, is that uh, her blood pressure spiked. And so she needed to go to the hospital to make sure that everything was okay. And it was, she was released yeah. after being there for right. only like an hour and a half. I'm glad to hear um, that. But we were, before all of that happened, we were planning on, I was planning on having my aunt and my uncle who were in town from Chicago and my grandmother and my uh, mom and stepdad over to the house today for ribs. Um, one of my passionate hobbies is smoking meats. And uh, so instead of getting the full four racks that I thought, you know, I only got three because they told me that they weren't going to come. And so, but now they are going to come, which I'm excited about them coming. But um, I spent the better part of the morning prepping and and doing that process so that I would be, you know, available at four o'clock central time for this. So right now I've got three full racks of smoked ribs resting in my cooler, which, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be delicious. I'm very excited about it. I'm happy for you. 
I am. I'm super happy for you. I'm vegetarian, so that's why I, I was just going to say maybe you are not a meat eater and that was what that comment was. Yeah. Which yeah, but it's funny. I that's what I love about it, right? I'm like, "Hey, can you put like a some foil on the top rack thingy and put some like zucchinis and portobellos yes. for me?" Thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And whenever that moment happens where we are um grilling outdoors together, you got it. There's no problem. So, let's get into this. Um yes. How did you initially get into music yourself? At what point in your life did that start to become a thing that you were pursuing? What were you pursuing? Were you playing an instrument? Was it singing? How did that all happen? So I grew, I mean, I came out of my mother singing, right? Did you? I mean, like, we all say that. But uh, I was cast as Mary Poppins in the total bootlegged version, elementary school version of Mary Poppins, which of course was the most illegal thing to ever happen on the face of the planet, of where the director was like the third grade teacher and he like just translate, like put all of the lines from the movie, right? So I was cast as Mary Poppins in third grade. And uh, that was my foray onto the stage. But um, what caused you to audition for that in the first place? Because it was like an elementary school, right? They're like, we're going to do a school show. So you wanted to perform? You wanted to be in the limelight? You had some... I did. Some... Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, you know, I was like that little three-year-old girl that was like, family, come all here. And then I'd be like making up songs for six hours and my family would be like, it's so good. Stop, please. <laughs> um. So I was always singing, always perform, definitely performing not just walking around the house singing but it was right like, sure sure hairbrush in one hand my mom bought me one of those do you remember these do you remember the microphones that you could pull the antenna out and then you would turn the radio absolutely and tune right? to the correct frequency and then you could yes and then you could be loud so my mom bought me one of those and i was like a rock star so i wanted to sing my whole entire life of course and this might be controversial to the audience, but of course, when I was about 11, I wanted voice lessons and everywhere we went for voice lessons, they were like, no, you should take piano first because that was a thing back sure. in my, when I was 11. And so I started piano lessons and praise the good Lord Jesus. This woman was like, why are you in piano lessons? And you, all you she, want to do is sing. <laughs> yeah. It, but she noticed that I would take to all the pop rock stuff and the musical theater stuff. So she stopped trying to teach me classical piano, which is what she was known for. Right. And God bless her. She like taught me how to do chords and like roll arpeggios in my left hand while I played a melody in my right hand. Like she was like, I'm going to teach you how to read the lead sheet. I'm going to teach you how to like play what you want to sing. And then when she felt she was past her um, ability to serve me and my family, um, she had a heart to heart with my mom. And, oh, she taught me like this doobie stiru, doobie stiru from like, you know, sure. I mean, you know this, like I'm like yeah. 11. I don't sing classical music anymore, but it was bad. I But I got like a gold thing at like 11 and, you know, in like the school CME or whatever. And at that point, she was like, please do not make this child take piano anymore. Get her into voice lessons. And I did not do it because we couldn't find someone that I um, liked. I would meet with these voice teachers and I'm like, this person doesn't get me. When I was 14, I got cast as a featured extra with Livermore Valley Opera Company in like the Merry Widow or something. And I had okay. like three singing lines at age 14 and I was freaked out. Freaked out from what? Well, I was like, I don't know how to sing opera. I uh -huh. just like did this because my friends who were seniors in high school, they're like, let's all go do an opera. And I'm like, that sounds fun. So um, that's how I got started in the classical thing. I found right at that same time, Pamela Hicks Gailey had moved. She was met, met opera audition winner lady she mm -hmm. just moved to my area we found her and the rest was history she was like i'm an opera singer i'm going to teach you how to sing correctly 
Because back then, there was the one correct and then the thing that will ruin you. However, she really, she's not like that anymore. She's totally like up and up and all of that. But at the time, she heard me saying gospel because I was singing gospel in church. I was singing musical theater at high school. Like I was doing everything. And the only opera stuff I was doing was like. At the the Livermore? Livermore Valley Opera Company. I mean, when they were like tiny inside of like a church basement. Sure. Um, CMEA, which is like California Music Educators Association competitions. And then getting ready to audition for colleges. Right. But um, that was it. And she heard me saying operator by Manhattan Transfer. Oh, yeah, sure. And she pulled me aside after the concert and she's like, where the hell has that been? (laughs) And I'm like, I didn't know I was allowed to sing like that in front of you. And she said, listen, I don't know how you're doing it. Does it hurt? I'm like, nope. She's like, can you do it all day long? And I'm like, yep. And she's like, great. Then we're going to do everything. We're going to do that. We're going to do Janis Joplin. We're, you know, so we would spend our voice lessons like listening to Joan Sutherland. Right. And Laura Nero. Wow. You know, so um, that I went to University of Northern Colorado. I was allowed to d- attempt to double major in musical theater and vocal performance. That was a hot mess. I was going to say, how'd that work out? I went up not well. I left after two years. Uh-huh. Um, wound up getting a music degree with an emphasis in voice at an extremely tiny liberal arts college in Oakland, California, decided to go get my master's degree. But what that did is that I knew I wanted to be a performer because me, my experience with my teacher, I was like, I'm going to be a voice teacher when I grow up. Mm. I was going to say, I, I mean, I don't think I have ever heard of someone having that experience of having a voice lesson where you have the opportunity to listen to such a diverse and focus on such diverse repertoire and you know genres within singing you know I mean that's kind of amazing she is a unicorn you know and um what it but what it did is it she's the one who started me on like I mean now crossover is a thing right? right like I teach crossover and really at that point she was just so concerned with me hurting myself because that was still the majority thought that she was like bringing in slp textbooks and talking to slps and putting me in touch with slp so i was getting this like crossover education but it was very much piecemealed together it wasn't like i went to for, sorry, for, for anyone who might be listening. No, go ahead, please. Can you define crossover and SLP? What 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 do you mean specifically when you're... Sure, sure. So I think um, crossover is this idea that we start from a classical tradition or maybe we start from a different tradition and we cross over into other genres. So it's this idea that all singers... Um, should be could be able to sing across genre like argument conversation right Uh, but it's this idea that people should be able to sing across genre if they want to make money right right right. um and then slp is the united states term for speech language pathologist believe in like canada and uk it's slt speech language therapist technician therapist yeah okay um but yeah, that's how we were. I think I froze on the thing, but we'll come back. I'm sure. I know. I think I. I don't know what the. Uh, I don't know if it's your upload or my download or Facebook or who knows. But I, I hear you perfectly well, and uh, usually we get some good comments on the video feed if people are like, "Wait, I can't hear or see." So who knows? Yeah, great. I think we're so. Fine. Yeah, that's what that's what we did. So I started um, learning about singing all the different styles by just what is vocal health. Right. Um, and piecemealed it together myself. Um, and now it's so amazing. We have people who do that for a living and there's entire books 
you know, written about it. And when do you think that that became like and... a, a norm? When, when, when did crossover study, let's say become, uh, oh yeah, this is, this is what everybody's doing now. 2000s. Yeah. Okay. So it's been a while. Yeah. I think, um, I don't actually think it's fully disseminated throughout the singing world. Um, being an independent studio owner mm -hmm. and not being part of kind of the formal pipeline of singing. I think in that world, it's, it's a must, it's a must have, right? Because we go, we get these degrees. I mean, like I said, I, I got a vocal perform. I went originally to, to university of Northern Colorado to double major because I was totally bought in hook, line, and sinker that if I wanted my voice to be healthy, I had to get the vocal performance degree. Right. And if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, I had to get the musical theater degree. Mm. So um, I don't think that we, I don't think that we generally ha have that zeitgeist anymore. I think, you know, now that there's more programs that are specifically in musical theater, just a handful of programs trying to go into pop rock jazz, um, I think it's a little different, but anyone who doesn't go on to a formal singing career, one of the options they have open to them is to open a voice studio. And many people do. And when you get into that situation, you realize that your classical degree is going to either keep you poor. <laughs> right. Or you're going to have to be very clear about who you serve and very clever in how you market that so that it becomes a value add to the average singer who wants to take voice lessons, who might be looking to you as their teacher. Right. right. You know, um, but I think is the 20, the, two, the early 2000s is probably when it really started. When you mentioned that you only stayed around at Colorado for two years, mm -hmm. um, what were the big, like you know, two or three uh, highlight uh, struggles or challenges that you had that of trying to simultaneously pursue those two degrees? Well, I don't think I was mature enough, honestly. I was really, I did not understand the performer life and I definitely didn't understand kind of the opera field mm -hmm. because all of my experiences were with opera up until then were extremely healthy and positive except for like this one yo-yo guy but like everyone was like so encouraging and they were like you can do this and i had like no idea that like there was i didn't even know what a diva was i didn't know that like some person was gonna try to like steal my wig and put ants in it you know what i mean like i just had no idea and so part of it was that I was not mature enough to handle kind of the toxicity that came with that environment. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying it's always like that. I'm just saying in that environment at that time for me, it was toxic. Yeah. So that was the big challenge. Literally time management. Literally. So I could remember going to rehearsal, being in rehearsal. I played Mrs. McLean and Susanna. Right. So I'm singing Mrs. McLean. Wait, is that the one that gets to sing? I wouldn't touch. I them. wouldn't touch them. Peas of hern. Right. You know, like Love. that kind of thing. That was very musical theater the way I just did it because That's fine. I, but I promise it was all head voice ish back then. I promise. Right. Very open, round, chesty. I wouldn't touch <laughs> them. Peas of hern. Is that better? Oh okay. my God. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for the comments. Yeah. Just here we go. Here we go. Um, so I would run across the campus from the opera music building to like the musical theater building where I was like working on chess and like singing through and helping understudy Svetlana in chess, which is, you know, I, ah, you know, like that kind of thing. And then at night I would go to do the jazz gig. Oh, wow. And then... The next, you know, Sunday morning at church, I would get up and be like, power no. ballad. Jesus no, was that, so was your church a, a contemporary uh, kind of music church or gospel or what was? Gospel and contemporary music okay. all the way. So, I mean, you know, singing huge Sandy Patty stuff when I'm 18. Right. right. 
right you know, so this that kind of yeah i can i can I, I'm, I'm dizzy thinking about how you even manage to keep all those things uh separately together that's incredible well i will say it, it's probably because i didn't know any better right right like and if, sometimes if when you don't no know that you shouldn't you... be able to do it right if if it. so if no one has ever told you hey you're not supposed to be able to sing rossini and sandy oh, patty no. <laughs> sandy patty in the same day right then maybe i would have not known that right. but no one had told me that and i was like i want to do it there you go so that would time management not being mature enough for the toxicity and um then i got like engaged to the wrong guy okay. and had to and broke up and then had to go right right which isn't really about unc but is it though who knows maybe <laughs> <laughs> so uh you, you mentioned then you went on to do the the smaller school private liberal arts university and then you went on to do a master's what did you do your master's in worship theology and the arts I have a Holy. master's in theology wow okay mm -hmm. and then did you go on to do a doctorate after that no okay you were done you'd learned thought about getting a phd at yale uh -huh. divinity uh-huh um, but I decided that I didn't have the personality to spend like six years on one topic. Fair enough. So I, I and I knew that I did not want to go into academia. Like I, it, that's the terminal degree, right? Is the doctorate's the terminal degree in order to sure. be in academia. And I was much more interested in creating my own thing and um, letting the winds carry me amongst the world. Of course. You know, so I thought, well, since I know I don't want to work in academia, I'm not going to get the doctorate. Um, and I was kind of tired of school. I wanted to, like, get to work already, right. you know. And at so, that point in time, was that idea of work, like opening up your own studio and teaching or was that? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. So I wanted to have the multi hyphenate life where I was like I was artistic directing in name only. A small youth theater in L.A. I had a voice studio. I was like teaching a voice class. I was doing film and television side hustle stuff. Like I was just doing that whole LA cause it was LA. So like the LA life. Mm -hmm. And then when I decided, no, I'm going to like officially open a voice studio and I did that. And then we just never looked back until I moved to Silicon Valley. And I realized, wow, a lot of people don't know how to like run a voice studio. <laughs> And um, I had just been fortunate enough to be interested in business. My husband's interested in business. And I, um, he was getting an MBA at Santa Clara. And so I just tagged along to like, go hear like Al Gore speak and like Steve Jobs. And like my students started to be like the VP of marketing at Netflix. And oh, wow. you know, like it just started to, I just was interested in it anyway. So I started to help my friends with their businesses. Then I moved here. I went to a voice conference. I spoke on belting for classical singers. Sure. No one wanted to talk about that after my presentation. <laughs> Did you, was that, was that from a, from a, uh, result of just, or, or was it like, I don't know why. Why didn't they want to talk about it? Well, I I may have been boring, although I doubt that. I don't think so. Um. Well, this is what happened: is I had like ten people. I remember it like it's so vivid in my mind. There were like ten teachers. They had all picked up on the line in my bio that said runs an ind runs a successful independent voice studio in. Right. And literally every question was like, "How do you run a successful independent voice studio, Michelle? Like, forget about the belting. Teach me how to make money." Yeah. And that's when I was like, oh, maybe I'm supposed to do this mm -hmm. universe. And the rest is history. Here we are. And I get to speak with the amazing Weston Hurt oh, just please. because of that moment. Uh huh. Well, but, uh, what were, I mean, obviously you didn't um, immediately find the well-oiled, brilliant machine that you and, and yours are today when you started mm -hmm. off with this idea what were the initial challenges and struggles that you like what were the big like hashtag fails that you ended up you know 
regretting uh, after you tried, you know, different different approaches. Um, to the business coaching thing. Business, or yeah, coach. business coaching, or 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 even setting up your own studio. You know, trying to mm. figure it out. Like how you know, I mean, I know, I mean, from you know, I kind of have three separate lives going. I'm I'm a performer, but I'm also a private teacher with a lot of professional students that are in that kind of young artist, yeah. 25 to 32 kind of range that are wanting to pursue the career. And then I'm also on faculty at UMKC Conservatory. Mm -hmm. So I also teach there. Um, and, you know, I will say that in my private studio, I, you know, I, I, I'm sure I could do a lot more to increase the opportunity to work with more singers. Um, with pricing and with marketing and with a, a whole slew of things that I'm sure you could help me out with. <laughs> um, but I certainly have feel like, felt like in, in a, a number of ways, I've just, people would look at what I'm doing and go, you realize you're an idiot, right? <laughs> like, like, I'm sure that I'm making huge mistakes by not doing this, that, and the other. So, you know, the premise of this show is to sort of talk openly about yeah. the different pitfalls and challenges that we've made in, in our pursuit of where we, where, where we are. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I talk with, um, you know, professional opera singers about the technical challenges that they are presented with, you know, when they first started singing or when they've changed repertoire to something bigger or whatever, um, and, and what they're currently working on. Because, I, I, again, I think so many young singers, they, they, they dehumanize these, these singers as gods and, and, and don't realize that, like, oh, no, 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 they, too, still continue to have voice lessons. They still, too, struggle with things. So, oh, yeah. I guess I'm trying to find out what is what is your version of that in in, in yeah. your approach to your studio, your private studio, but also to your to your um, business coaching. Yeah. So with the private studio, I would say the first mistake that I made was was thinking that I was teaching voice lessons, <laughs> as opposed to um, life therapy. <laughs> no, as opposed to creating an environment for someone to become the best version of themselves and how different that is in an independent studio environment as it is than it is in a formalized school university or, academic yeah, yeah, environment yeah. um i made the mistake of thinking that people valued me because of my knowledge around the voice and so therefore i just had to spin and spin and spin and spin on getting more knowledgeable about the voice when really what people were valuing were these experiences of discovering something new about what their voice could do. Wow. And that at the end of the day, every person that comes, whether they're been singing for one month or 10 years, has something that is deeply inside them that has not connected to their instrument. And our job isn't to sit there and go, your vocal tract and your vocal folds and your this and your formants. We need to know that, I feel, but that's not my job. My job is to coax out what's already there in their sing file of their brain. Meredith Coles, Colby calls it their sing file. I love that, you know? Yeah. And to coax that out and then to introduce them into the way that they can rewrite that code. Um because that's what's going to develop their own internal feedback loop How about what they're happy with. Like, what, what was it? That, was there like a moment where you were like, oh my God, what am I doing? I this think, is what I need to be doing. I think when I started to get, so I started to get high level high school kids who specifically wanted to go to college for musical theater. Right. And they were like, I'm not singing for fun. I'm singing because I'm moving to New York after I go to UMish, you know what I mean? Right. Like that kind of thing. Sure. And I was so like, oh my God, I have to know everything. I have to do everything right. I have to make sure their voice is perfect and da da da. And it was a mom who just came in and she's like, hey, go back to the car, you know, student. And she came into the studio and she said, Michelle, I just want you to know that whether so and so makes it in this or not, I value so deeply that you tell her the truth, that you speak life into her, and that you don't blow sunshine up her ass. Right. Because that is what is going to make her a fantastic human, whether she performs on Broadway or, or not. not. Right. 
And it was that moment where I was like, oh my God. Like this woman does not even care about their their kid's voice at all. <laughs> now, yeah. that being said, I'm sure that if the daughter was not getting a quality education and was not getting the roles that she, I mean, I'm sure that the, I'm sure, right? Sure, but right. for me, I was young. I was 32 maybe. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's young. Sorry, 32 year olds. And um, it it was just a different shift because I had been like stupidly teaching since I was high school in high school, just like booping my way through. Right. But that was the big shift. And um, from there, then I realized this is what I need to sell. This is what I need to sell because this is what I'm good at. Yeah. And this is what makes me me. And um, I don't think I, I think we we get caught up as independent teachers. So like on that independent business side, we get caught up in like thinking that we're just outside versions of academia mm-hmm. where there's the same results and the same goals or high school and or whatever, high school level, whatever, or whatever it is. Yeah. And we don't really, really understand kind of the offer. Yeah. So, that and then, of course, I underpriced because everybody underprices when they start out because they have some story in their head about how well, they're not important and not valuable and all that kind of thing. What's your spiel on on that since you bring it up? How, how do you price yourself? How, how does one price themselves competitively? I mean, I just had a really great conversation with one of my colleagues. You know, when you're when you're offering a an, an hour long voice lesson, mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously, maybe if it's a current student and they're wanting to continue study over the summer, there might be a reduction in rate, or if it's an alumni or, or a family friend or something, or, but, but then again, it's like, how do you look at what you do and then say, here's what I should charge per hour. Cause there's no set, you can't go to the other. St- I mean, I guess you can obviously talk to colleagues that do the same thing and figure out what they're charging. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think a lot of people do have trouble with putting a number to such a sort of ethereal kind of product yeah well i think i have a whole like presentation on pricing um i think the mistake is you never start with market so market is there to give you information about where you sit in that market and about Mm -hmm. where your brand is going to need to sit once you figure out what your billable hour needs to be in order for you to make the money that you need to make in order to run your business and run your life so to me what you need to price has nothing to do with anything First, what do you need to make? What do you want to make? How much do you want to work? What do you want to make? How is your brand in alignment with that number? How is your experiences in education, your unique value proposition? How do all those things change that number or color the information around that number? Right. And then we go, we have this billable hour number. I know that if I sell an hour of my time, this is how much it needs to be. If I'm young and I've never done this before, maybe I need to do that. Maybe I need to make that money, not just in a one-on-one voice lesson situation. Maybe I need to have a couple different revenue streams that are in line with my competencies and my skill sets until I get more competencies and skill sets and experience. Right. Or maybe I don't want to try to do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be like, great, this is what the billable hour is. Take it or leave it. Right. You know, and I think what happens is people get all in their feelings about the pricing and they say, oh, but what if someone can't afford you? Right. Can't afford me. I'm like, really, you're going to you are going to price your entire business and life based on if someone else can't afford you. Don't be getting in other people's pocketbooks. Number one, that's rude. <laughs> Don't tell me what I'm go- what I'm allowed to spend my money on. Never right. do that. Right. You know, and I don't think we should be telling other people what they should and shouldn't spend money on either. And if we can say, this is what I'm go- going to give you. This is what the results are going to be with co-responsibility, not just false delivery of services kind of thing, but with co-responsibility, this is what I offer. Here's the price. Take it or leave it. That's up to the consumer to decide if they would like to make that happen or not. Right. And I really don't like the way that 
people in general, this is, this is a lot of service industries. It's not just voice, by the way. But it is, it is highlighted in the voice profession where we make these decisions based on our own traumas around money. Amen. And Absolutely. I'm like, aren't, you're, you are literally perpetuating a field of underpaid individuals. Right. You are perpetuating it because of your only own money stories. Because if I am charging a healthy rate, I have immediately given permission to everyone else in my market to change a healthy rate. But voice teachers like to do this. Well, who does she think she is charging so much money? It's right. like, you've never taken a voice lesson with me, so shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> Number one. Exactly. Number two, you are not who is paying me. You're not my ideal client. Right. You wouldn't pay me that much. You don't need me for that. Right. But someone else does, just like someone else needs use that I can't provide them. I, there you go. Thinking you can serve every single singer on the face of the planet is not only hubris, it's very bad business. So, I mean, you got me started, Weston. You asked me a question and then I just started to talk. No, I love it. I love it. I love it because I think that you hit the nail on the head. There's so, everything that you just said, I agree with 100%. Um, but it's just so wonderful to hear it from another perspective. Um, so you mentioned something before we even went on the air that this mm -hmm. agreement, right? Because you, you talked, you, you, you spoke just, just recently about the, um, how did you, I can't even remember what you just worded it as, um, the, uh, the expectations versus agreements. Well, that was what like we talked about. Before we were talking about? Before, before we went on, on live, you mm -hmm. were saying the expectations versus the assumptions. And yeah. how that, I wanted you to talk about that. But just now you, you said something about how there has to be an agreement between uh, both parties, right? Yeah. Um, but, but talk about that a little bit, the, um, the, the assumptions versus the agreements. Yeah. So, and I think to give the audience context, you and I were talking about like, well, you know, what do you do with these? How do you manage the relationship with your students? Right. right? Ultimately. And I think that's something that we can all, every service provider can do better is whether, you know, whether it's, and this isn't a put down when I say this. So whether it's a hobby voice studio, meaning that it is not your main source of income, right? right. Or it's your only source of income. One of the things that does not happen in voice is a really clear understanding of what is going to happen in the lesson and what we, what we in other service industries would call the scope of service. Mm -hmm. And then there's no written agreement. There's no conversation. There's just the student comes in with this idea of what a voice lesson is supposed to be with you right? Based on their stories about who you are and all your successes and everything that you've done. They have this big story in their head about what they're going to get. And right. then you have a story in your head about what that student must want out of you to come to you, right? Right. And there's all these assumptions back and forth about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, the results that are going to happen based on whatever <laughs> without any person saying, what do you want? What are we doing together? Right. What are your expectations of our time together? How do you see this relationship forming? What kind of time are you willing to commit to your practice every day? That's an amazing question. What kind of money are you ready to invest in your vocal education? How often do you feel comfortable meeting? How would you like to communicate? Email, text, phone, Zoom? in person and we just don't ever talk about that. So with my clients, like in Speakeasy Cooperative and then people that do my programs, I'm like, when we're doing your policies, like that section of the work, it's like, here are the things that you need to outline in your policies. And your policies are going to become the agreement that you make with your students. So the other thing that people do wrong is they write all their policies and then they email them and then they get a, like a signed page back and then they think, oh yeah, okay, I'm done. And I'm like, please, nobody read that shit. <laughs> it's like the Apple iTunes agreement that you have it to is. click on. I agree with all of it. It is. Did you, ever, did you ever see that South Park episode? Yes, totally. <laughs> so terrible, not terrible, only sorry. that, 
Not only that, but then they get angry when the person doesn't remember. My favorite question is to be like, awesome. Tell me what the third paragraph in your policies is. Mm Mm-hmm. And you can't even answer the own question. Mm -hmm. You don't even know. So that being said, it's more like, listen, your policies are a framework. A contract is a framework so that everyone is clear about what's okay and what's not okay so that the relationship can be healthy. But the policy will never replace a hard conversation. It will never replace communication between two people around something that they might be in conflict around and it will never replace um oh i had a good thing in my head and it just went away and now i sound dumb no no what are your two biggest frustrations with students and with other voice teachers or even with yourself when it relates to this stuff that you're talking about oh only two no i'm just kidding um <laughs> You know, I, I will say I, I generally have very general frustrations and I'm not like voice teachers do this and students do that. But I, 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 I get frustrated from a place of hurt. Like, come on, y'all, this could be so much easier if you just like wore your mama pants, Mm -hmm. you know? So I would say my biggest frustrations would be the inability to have a crucial conversation without out of fear of hurting feelings or something like 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 an inability and this is underdeveloped sense of self this is toxicity within the field about are you even safe to say something to your teacher because how many students in the past especially as they get older and more professional how many toxic relationships did they like just get bowled over by that by the time they come to you you got a little healing work to do you got a little trust building to do right You know, so I'd say first, the frustrating thing is that that happens, that that there are cycles of toxicity that feed into a master apprentice model of teaching that I don't think works anymore. There's a difference between passing down information and thinking you have all the information someone needs to sing in their own body with their own voice. Yeah. And and I I mean I don't know I don't know if I'm gonna offend any of your audience but I'm I'm very against so apologies <laughs> but I'm very against this idea that the voice teacher knows more about the person's voice in front of them than the person themselves knows. Well, one of the things that I always say to them is like you know your voice better than anybody else. Yeah, like you're the one that lives with it. You know if you know what it feels like. I don't. I I constantly am asking the question. Well, what did that feel like? What I don't I know. Like? I know what it would feel like in my voice. I know what it would feel like when I do it. But mm-hmm. when I'm when I'm working with a singer, I'm like, what did that feel like? How did that? Oh, that hurt. Okay, it didn't sound like it would hurt, but I trust you, and I want. I, we don't want to go down that path if you're saying that. That, but yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think it's great. So it the question being the frustrations, I would say. Um, it's kind of like a mixed bag of, it's not like the students do this and the teachers do this, but it's like everybody does this thing where they avoid conversations instead of dealing with their feelings, speaking the truth, honoring and creating and enforcing boundaries, because really that's what it is. Can you and, give you some know, examples of what those boundaries might be? So touching people is a great mm-hmm. example. And we sometimes, some teachers use a lot of physical touching and they say, well, can I touch you while they're going toward the student? You know, so what does the student think? The student thinks, well, I get better say yes, because you're going to touch me anyway. <laughs> right, your hands right? Are I mean, this almost, is a very right. concrete example. Yeah. Um, and so how do you give the student the power to say, please do not touch me when you're already like, you know, two inches from their larynx? Right, think, this right. is a great thing about Zoom, right? That's, I mean, I've been teaching online for way before COVID. And one of the things I actually love about it is this idea of introducing the student to their own body you know like i'm not gonna touch their larynx you touch your larynx put your hands here you know these are your grab your sternocleidomastioids you know like whatever you're doing and they get to know their own body because you can't be all up in their grill yeah so i think that's a concrete example so how i think that conversation could go well is either just don't do it which is very also, I think, is okay, right? But maybe the conversation goes like this. Sometimes 
students and teachers touch each other in order to communicate a physical concept. Whatever you are comfortable with will not affect our relationship. Absolutely. What are you comfortable with? And as soon as the person says, oh, I'm fine. I'm comfortable with touch. You can touch my neck and you can touch my shoulders. It's like, great. Make a little note. Sally says neck and shoulders. Thank right. you. Right. And if the person says, I don't want you to touch me at all, you say, fantastic. No problem. No touching. Right. You know, and you treat it like it's not a big deal when someone has just been like, this is my boundary. Right. Um, so that's a concrete example. How about money? <laughs> Everyone doesn't like, right? People have hard, they have a hard time talking about money because again, your own story is about money. Right. So it's okay if someone says to you, you're too expensive. Okay, no problem. Like instead of hearing, oh my God, I'm a horrible I should person. change my rates. Uh... I should change my rates, right? Or on the other side, someone demand, like a student demanding more and more time out of you and you feeling like if you can't draw the boundary to them and say, listen, my communication hours are X time to X time. I am so excited to be able to deal with this during that time or at your next lesson. Bye. Right. right. Have a great night. That is genius because so often, you know, I think before we set those boundaries or realize that those boundaries need to be set, you get a text at whatever, oh, it'll, this will just take a second, hold on, you know, and you, and you mm -hmm. reply back, but you're absolutely right. It's like, why am I doing that? Why am I giving this person, you know, any amount of time that they want with any questions that they want about anything <laughs> that, you know, would fall under any umbrella Mm -hmm. and not getting reimbursed for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting because back to the pricing for like, I actually have a formula because it's funny. You're like, well, you can't have a formula. I'm like, I have a formula. <laughs> so, but what this formula does is it takes into account all that stuff. If you want to do that, then we take that into account and then you get to put it in your agreement. Right. You are welcome to text me anytime Monday through Friday from three to seven. You won't hear back from me probably between 7 and 7.30 because I'll be teaching. I will answer you within 48 hours. If I don't, please text me again. Right. I do not answer texts on the weekends. And, you know, like you're just very clear about it where people, um, and then they blame the students, right? I wrote a blog and I was like, stop blaming the students. Because we teach people, like you just said, we teach people how to treat us. That's right. So if someone's going to text us at 11 p.m. and we answer them back, what? that's not their fault that they're going to text at, at 11 again. They think right. it's okay. We just answered them back. <laughs> right, right. You know, so I think boundaries and the like owning your own power is something that I wish everybody did because it's just a healthier conversation. What do you mean when you say owning your own power? Owning your own power, like just owning that what what you want is okay and that the other person that agreement does not equal acceptance and agreement does not equal love and we very much have a culture that teaches us agreement equals love agreement equals trust agreement equals camaraderie and and I, I mean that in a different sense of like the expectations agreements conversation. I mean, that isn't like if we disagree and we have two different opinions, there's a broken trust there to people. People think there's actually a broken trust. Hmm. I can't trust you because you don't agree with me. On and on a hundred percent of things. <laughs> on, right, right. And you know, part of that is social media. Part of that is um, th the current political environment in the United States and the 24 hour news cycle. Yeah. Part of that. I mean, there's lots of cultural things that make that so across the board, not just in the voice profession, but seeing that the voice profession is so identity driven and is, I mean, it's a profession of narcissists. That's not bad. That just is. I and mean, that's a different kind of personality to deal with, even more so the reason to say, this is where my boundaries are. This is what's okay with me. I love you even though we don't agree. 
I can be with you in the room, even though we don't agree. And then when it gets to a point where you, where it's toxic for you saying, I respect us both enough that I'm out (laughs) because this isn't working, you know? Yeah. 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 I think, I I mean, well, I was just going to say, I wish everybody, I'm definitely going to send my mom to you. I think she, uh, my mom is a, is a retired, um, high school choir director who who owns her own voice and piano studio nice. and i i think that uh she could so incredibly benefit from just hearing you oh she's definitely gonna watch this but but i, I just think that would be amazing for her to, to set up her studio in a different way that would be all of the things that you that you're talking about i mean not just her but i mean everybody i just wish that myself included you know um needs to think in this way and needs to realize but of course the, the issue is right we all get brought up by or have experienced on our own a completely different way of of doing yep. things right because yeah i i went to college in the 90s and grad school in 2000s and and at that time you know somewhere somehow the assumption is made that uh, this teacher knows everything. And so I just have to do everything that this teacher tells me to do. I know nothing. My own opinions aren't valued. Uh, you know, this just, I don't know. I, I just don't think it, it and no one ever kind of step, stepped in to, to break that and to say, whoa, 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 what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, why do you, why do you assume that they know what they're talking about, right? Yeah. And then of course, how many years is it until you talk to a friend that says, oh, this, you know, teacher X, you know, they, they completely destroyed my voice and, and they teach at a prestigious place, right? Like some school that everyone's heard of. And you're like, they did what, what did they, they told you to do what, you know, it's like, you don't even start hearing those types of things until you're, you know, further along. And I, I have so many non-disclosure students. That's what I call them. Well, non-disclosure as in like, I have so many people who come to me and are just like, can you just help me sing again? Because, and I call them non-disclosures because I don't, they're not the student that I, they don't want anybody to know that they're taking with, Uh, uh uh you know, they just want privacy, which is fine. But I, I have many of these students and they come like from the prestigious things and i hear these stories as well and i really feel one of the good things about social media and like meeting dana and like meeting you is like we now have an opportunity to call into the light what was once in shadow and i think that makes all of us better that makes me better i'm gonna think twice before i say something i'm gonna think twice before i communicate in a way that is ineffective and maybe mean or if i do accidentally respond from my own trauma i'm going to apologize for it and you know say i did that wrong can we talk about that i'm sorry and uh, i mean that right there is huge right being able to admit your own vulnerability or your mistake to a student even and you know to to lift the veil of like oh by the way did you think that i knew everything in the world you know what i mean like i just feel like that's such a misnomer it's i mean i would so classical world i think like and this is mostly from stories i get from people you know the teachers who come to me in that pipeline Um, in my short, short experience there, I think that there's, there's still this idea of legacy teaching that is really powerful in the cultural narrative and myth of how we learn to sing. Mm -hmm. And I, a myth, capital M myth, like grand story, not a lie, but, um, there's, it's part of this grandiose, beautiful succession of saints that I think is really awesome and wonderful, but we've just taken it like a little too far into like guruism. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I think that the, mom- the, the best thing we can do for any student is to like back to the power is say at the end of the day, you sing the way you want to sing. You sing from your soul. And anything that is happening inefficiently in the technique in order for you to do in order to succeed at a thousand seat house, a 1500 person house, 3000 person house, you know, as your 
body is your amplification device. Anything that technical that we need to do in order to make that more efficient and effective for you, fantastic. But at the, you know, at the end of the day, your sound is yours, not mine. Right. And, you know, part of it, I, I don't know. I might get in trouble for saying this because it's a little bit out of my ass, but I'm going to say it because it's also a little bit not out of my ass. I really get concerned when just because someone is a stellar singer, they get put in positions of teaching. Because that person doesn't necessarily understand how to teach, the art of teaching. Right. They understand how to sing. They understand what's going on in their body. They understand, um, they might even have concept, like remember concepts that were said unto them. But but that very specific skill set of how do I get this information out of my head in the way that I contextualize it into your brain in the way you can make it alive is very different. And, and I don't like how the money game, the system perpetuates the legacy teaching by putting people in positions of power and of teaching power that are only there because they had a career. Well, you know what that requires the teacher to do that had the career is to forego ego. Because if you mm -hmm. are somehow attached to your ego as a performer and therefore mm -hmm. teaching te a teacher, you are unable to set that aside and really yeah. focus solely on the benefit of the student who's standing in front of you. That's good. That's really good. That's what I've found, at least. And that's, that's what I try to completely disassemble when I go into my, my studio, right? It's like, I'm not there for me. I'm there for them. Mm -hmm. And, and the whole... sorry, I'm so sorry. No, no, no I go ahead. interrupted you. No, you're fine. I mean, I'm, I was just going to say that, you know, the people who live upon their own legacy and rely on what they did at XYZ Opera House or concert hall or whatever, mm -hmm. to somehow make up for their lack of ability to do what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the whole, that's the problem. But it's the system too, right, Weston? Because well, the, it's the sure. schools that the do that. that would, the system that would perpetuate that. And right. And that would hire somebody and, that would do that. And I would say, and I don't think, you know, I'm going to take back what I said earlier about just pipelining it into the classical thing because that was wrong. And I should have said, we have this just cultural narrative that if you can sing, you can teach. And I'm, I'm so interested. I get, I get students that ask me like, cause I have a big interview process to make sure that students fit with me and all of that, like um, lessons first before I take people. And it's so interesting to me how many students ask me about my own career mm. and I'm open about it, but I'm, I always think to myself, it's so fascinating that this person assumes that those things that somehow what I'm about to tell them about my singing experience qualifies me to teach them how to use their instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I also get very frustrated about that too, with this whole, like, if you can't sing, you can't teach thing, because there are many, 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 many teachers that I know who have gone through a vocal injury, gone through a pathology, are no longer able to literally phonate the way that they once did. Sure. And they are, fucking fantastic teachers right and i really push back against the if you didn't have a performance career you can't be a teacher thing well quite i mean i i think the exact opposite i mean i i, I have been very fortunate that three out of the five teachers that i've had had no performing career to speak of at all they all came from a place of just pursuing understanding of the voice and vocal pedagogy and some of the best teachers that I've ever witnessed and spoken with and agreed with, they haven't had successful performing careers. That doesn't mean anything about their teaching, yeah. right? And it's a totally different skill set. When I look at the two people of my my lineage of of teachers who did have performing careers, they were the ones that would just sort of tell stories and talk around things and had to demonstrate instead of explain. And you know, it's like, okay, well, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I agree 100%. Mm. It's like it doesn't have anything to do with what you're now, someone who's had a successful performing career might be able to help you network, maybe you'll make some calls for you. Like there's some benefits to it. Sure, I think they could coach you too pretty well. Sure. In certain repertoire that they might yeah, line yeah. up with what you're doing. I mean, there's, right. there's it's not like a complete waste, but at the same time, 
to to truly teach and to truly you know sort of acquire the difference uh i mean the, the whole package right like the whole puzzle that you're that you're talking about yeah it's so much more than, than just whether or not you had a successful performing career <laughs> yeah i think students can get smarter too i i really i really like when students get smart around how they're building their vocal team i think the days of my teacher are should be over if they're not over already um you know any student can go and get actually really solid vocal information on the internet now like maybe when it started out it was a little you know <laughs> but we have enough quality practitioners that are doing um you know online classes and online youtube videos like there's enough that you can wade through and find some really solid instruction so that when you get when you decide the person whose ears you want to trust you can have a conversation about those those conversations and then again it, it becomes less so much less about this is the person that's going to give me information which you know takes down that legacy kind of master apprentice uh, master apprentice model right. but and more about this is a person i trust to have this conversation with and to guide me with all the information i already have you know wow um all of our students are going on the internet and looking up what we said after the lesson all of them because they care they care right. about their sound they care about their voice they want to understand they were most of them if they were i mean i don't know i'm i'm 43 so i'm in that like middle Oregon Trail generation, right? Oregon Trail. <laughs> but um, you have died of dysentery. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm in that, but I I really think that most of our younger students, um, they it's they're not coming to us for the same reasons that we went to our student uh, that we went to our teachers for. Exactly. And um, the more that we understand that, I think the better practitioners we can be. Um. And you get to pick your own team, right? You can say, I know that this person's going to help me with this. I know that this person's going to help me with this. And yeah. if everyone, again, back to ego, if everyone just said, this is what I'm good at, then we could all create this wonderful vocal team for these individuals and really watch them shine. Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe that that's probably a little like Pollyanna, but I'll go with it. Rainbows I'll work and unicorns. Oh, well, yeah, no, me too. I mean... You know, I think that that there are some environments where that's actually possible. Um, you know, we we at uh, UMKC recently had an opportunity to sit down together as a voice faculty and talk about, you know, as we come back to campus next year in the fall, you know, it's going to give a whole new opportunity to reset and to rethink how we go about presenting our 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 program. And by the way. I've already got the coordinator for the voice faculty at UMKC watching this, who who said UMKC masterclass next year with Michelle. So, I want to yeah. come. I would love it. I don't teach opera though. Is that okay? Doesn't matter. What you what you preach is something that everyone needs to hear. You know, I think oh, I would so love often, that. like I said, so often people think that, you know, I mean, you call it crossover singing, crossover mm -hmm. teaching, crossover everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, because these principles that you're talking about are so incredibly important in a variety of different worlds, you know, and I think that um, everyone can benefit from it. You know, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all good stuff. Um, Gabriel Walker, who uh, Hi, he Gabriel. says, y'all, I don't know if you know him, but he's a, uh, he's a Steve Smith uh, student from Northwestern who oh, recently graduated there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, great, great baritone, bass baritone. And uh, he says, y'all are preaching good. So. I love him. So Stephen Smith was one of the master teachers when I was a Nats intern. So I'm going to be a Nats master teacher in like three weeks, two okay. weeks, some weeks. Four years ago, I was an intern and uh, Stephen Smith was one of the teachers. And so I got to meet him and sit next to him at dinner and hear so many, so many stories. He's so great many guy. great stories. He's um such a unique individual such a unique person and it was such a pleasure to get to meet him in person that one time i know he's really 
Oh, he's really fantastic. I studied, I studied with him. I started working with him in 2002 when I went to Juilliard and I worked with him for like eight and a half years. And I just, I'm, I'm, you know, his book, The Naked Voice. I'm one of the example singers on that CD. Oh, yeah. I have I'm, it on my I've got chapter. The, yeah. I think I'm number five on most of the things. Uh, he's a, he's such a, a, an incredible human. His, his, I, I, I use things about his philosophy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all, yeah. all up in my, all up in my tongue root. Yeah, all up in there. I use I use things from his philosophy of teaching and my teaching on a daily basis. I just mm. I can't I can't say enough great things about him. Love him and Carol, his wife, who who played for yeah. lessons. Just such a such a great team. But um, well, listen, I, I've I've already utilized your your hour of time. And this this I just looked at the clock and I was like, what it might be like forty minutes in? No, we're we're an hour five in. You are time amazing. Flies when you're having fun. Hey, this hey. is true. This is true. Um. We didn't even really get into the whole subscription-based pricing thing that that that, uh, that made me aware of you in the first place. But I just, I, I really mean it when I say that this information is so incredibly important. And I really, really, really hope that so many people are able to take this and, and, and really put to use these different principles, because you're right, this idea of legacy teaching and this idea of, well, just, and then the opposite of that, the idea of giving and listen well listening to your students and realizing that they have ideas about what it is that they're coming to you with not the assumption of the teacher of like oh i know what this person needs and wants yeah. and how to do it right mm -hmm. and that we have yeah. the same that we have the same definition of what that is even when it's spoken right so someone will say yeah. oh, um i had uh, this is a great example i had a student come and they uh they were like, well, I just, I just want to be able to like get over my Passaggio a little bit higher. I'm a tenor. I'm a tenor. And I'm like, uh, I don't care what you are. I don't really care if you're whatever you are. We're going to try to work out this section of your voice that you feel uncomfortable with. But it was so interesting because their perception in their body of what they felt was successful was something that was a lot of work. It, hmm. I was like, this on a effort level one to 10, where are we at? And they're like, it's like an eight. I'm doing great. And I'm like, I'm You're like, like oh, okay. Level eight? okay. I'm, that's, by the way, seriously, honestly, one of my favorite ped talk and pedagogy, two of my favorite questions, every lesson, scale of one to 10 effort, your personal effort level, 10 being like, I'm working for it. And one being like, oh, doing not nothing. even working at all. Love that question because you you get a very you get a very good understanding of what they have now normalized in their body. Right. Based on the answer to he's like, this is an eight. It's so great. And I'm like, let's try that. At There's like so at much five. information in that statement. Yeah, exactly. Let's try that at five. Like what would happen if if effort was five? Right. You know, but then but then the sound won't come out if the effort's five. And I was like, well, let's see. Won't? let's find out you know let's just, let's just we're just playing we're just, we're just wondering we're just playing well, and speaking of steve smith my favorite quote of his is to say yeah people are so used to using so much localized muscular effort that when they sing that when they actually let go of that muscular effort they feel like they're no longer working I'm and so they feel like enough. well that doesn't even feel like i'm singing anymore right right because you were used to use you your your effort level was up at eight now we've actually made it far more efficient so you're down at what three or four Mm -hmm. Trust me, the sound is still coming out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then follow up question, personal volume level. Oh yeah, Just, absolutely. Right? Like show what, me what, what you call your, that. Show, show me your pianissimo. Show me yeah. your piano. Show me your mezzo piano. Yeah, I love that. Right. And then, you know, and then I think that we can put on our expert hat and be like, in a professional environment, that would actually be meant so forte. So right. let's just work on that, you know, or, you know, you, I love like, you know, doing a mezzo de voce. And I think by the way, a mezzo de voce is for every style, all the things, every person should always be doing all of the versions of mezzo de voce forever and ever. Amen. But, um, that's the other thing too, is like, okay, let's do like the, you know, mezzo de voce one where we're just working dynamics and their range dynamic range is here, but they are perceiving that their dynamic range is here right. because they've never kind of been invited in the both directions because that's not going to be loud enough. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't care if it's not going to be loud enough. I want to hear what P P P P P P P P P is going to sound like, or that's too loud. 
we don't that's gonna you know rings i don't care let's just wanna. right yeah. so it's um it's interesting that i know we're i'm making you talk longer than you want to but no no not me i'm i'm trying to be respectful of your time i, I could sit here I've, I've got the ribs and the yeti they're cooling down we're good my mom's not here yet they're so cooling down i gotta go at 3 30 that's when i have okay. to go so okay. we got 20 minutes um we can stay or we can go but um yeah, that's that's really I would love to all of that to say I would love and be honored to be allowed to come and speak to UMKC. Well, I think it would be an incredible opportunity for the students and for the faculty to get to know you and to get to hear these things, because like I said, I, it, it's it's you know, I don't care if you teach opera, I don't care if you are in the classical world or in the musical theater world or crossover or jazz or gospel or whatever it is. The principles are the same when we're talking about how to respect one another and how to make sure that we're listening to one another, how to create those boundaries and how to make sure that we have successful student, student teacher relationships. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that, that uh, you'd like to talk about that we haven't touched on that you feel is something that you would like for all singers to hear or for all teachers to hear? Mm. I mean, there's so many things. Can't you tell? Like, give me a topic and I can rip. <laughs> right? In the like, round. <laughs> play me a chord progression, Weston, and I'll make a song. <laughs> right. So <laughs> obnoxious, but uh, but fun. Um, I wish that all singers learned the difference between that they would give themselves the opportunity to learn the difference between between like complaining and 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 digging digging in mm -hmm. um and then take the time take the time to heal from any traumatic singing event that has ever occurred to them because i do think and i say when i say student i mean i'm still a student of course so i mean Likewise. i guess that's student and teachers right like Y'all, therapy is worth it. Do the work. Get, get, you know, everyone says broken people, broke, break people, hurt people, hurt people. Well, you know what? Healed people, heal people. Wow. And yeah. we people, need more people don't that. usually say that. <laughs> yeah, but, but we true. need more of that. We need we more do. of that. Believe the best, assume the best first, always. Always say, I might be misunderstanding. Let me ask more questions. Always. Mm -hmm. um, when someone tells you, I mean, I know these sound like little cliches, but I just really so truly believe it. When someone says that you've hurt them, that you've offended them, that you've um, aggressed upon them, whatever they say to you, stop and say, I am so sorry. Tell me more about that. Yeah. instead of defending yourself like just become better humans everybody everybody become better humans and Ooh. you know i selfishly say that because when you're a better human you're a better singer it's true because your empathy parts of your brain will get in cahoots with your polybagel nerve and your you know you'll reduce the cortisol in your brain you'll be able to get your superior laryngeal nerve and your you know your nervous no, system I, la, la, lu, I know la, right lu. so here's here i know it's like <laughs> but here's the deal when you are calm and you are centered it will show in your voice because your voice reveals all that's true it our voice reveals all and that's the great thing about that's why we can T tell such great stories right right so sing sing well i have a i have a client in speakeasy and her her handle is like sing your story right like sing your story use your voice for good and not evil and um if you need help doing that i know a girl well speaking of so you you've made reference to the speakeasy can you talk what is the speakeasy oh, yeah. co-op what is how, how i'm assuming that people i, I mean i know like i said no, i'm sending my mom your way um how do people get in touch with you? What is that co-op all about? How do they? Yeah, they... yeah. Thanks for asking that. That's a thank you. That's really generous. Um, so the Speakeasy Cooperative is a subscription membership group that is for voice-related businesses. So if you make money 
teaching voice, SLP, body worker that works with voice, voice, piano worker, you know, piano, piano worker, piano teacher that also does voice. Piano, piano tuner. Worker. Sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, if you want to come, we'll we'll have we'll have you. Um, it is a subscription service that is based around becoming a better human in order to run the business that you want to run. And then we do all the brass tacks and nuts and bolts of teaching. Um, and then I have a couple, you know, intensive programs that can also be done in a self-guided course of, around business. Um, but finding me, and then I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So finding me is best at my website or on my Facebook page or Instagram. So I can put that, I can go onto your page and put in the comments sure. all of okay. that. I think that might be easier for people. That'd be great. Um, yeah. Going through a rebrand right now, so don't get too attached to that lovely website you're about to see. Uh -oh. But my okay. blog is, I, I try to blog really regularly about these topics and, you know, it goes back and forth between mindset stuff and then brass tacks kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I do want my email list as well. So I'll put the links to all of that in there, but you know, email me, email my team. We can, we'll find what is right for you. We're not about like, this is what we do. You will buy it. It's like, what do you need? This is the thing that's created that will serve that need best in the most effective and efficient way. Kind of like teaching singing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Follow me on Facebook. Be it's on amazing. my email list, that kind of stuff. Well, thank you. I can't even tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and, and talking openly about this. I think these are conversations that need to be heard. And um, I think everyone has enjoyed it based on the, based on the comments. So thank you again. And I hope you have a great rest of your day out in California and um, a great lesson. Have fun with, thank you. Have fun with your ribs. Oh, I will. I will. I will. I will. And veggies. We're having lots of veggies. Thank you. I'm very, very happy. Well, I really appreciate back at you. Like I really have enjoyed this conversation. I can imagine that when I come, we will stay up very late in vibing Absolutely. and having hearty discussions. And you'll have a two hour time benefit to it. So you're late will will be super late to us, which will even be better. So <laughs> I'll be fancy. <laughs> Thank have you again. And I, like I said, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Thank you. You too, Weston. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Michelle.